on hitting your goals in every area of your business. Remember, the universe rewards the bold. A leader has to take the risks. Welcome to the Wealth on the Beach podcast. My name is Daniel Alonzo and I am your host today. We have one of the my most favorite people in the world on today. His name is Mike Landrum. He's been married for 29 years to his beautiful wife, Amy. Five kids. I'm, I'm wondering if he, if he understands how that, how that happened, but he's got five kids, lots of kids, three granddaughters under the age of three. Hey guys, this guy was a former NFL uh, football player with the Falcons, with the Atlanta Falcons and uh, started the business, uh, started in financial services in 1990. 63 regional vice presidents, 63 locations. This guy's got a business, an amazing, amazing business. Uh, 12, over 12 states, his businesses flow through 12 states, over 2,000 representatives, $1.2 million in income, over $17 million in career earnings, charter member circle of champions, next stop, $2 million, and of course resides in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Mr. Mike Landrum, uh, so what's it like being a pro football player getting hit by a guy that's 325 pounds? Well, it's a short career, I tell you that. Okay. The NFL, I've always heard, stands for not for long. Oh, uh, man. But, uh, but it was uh, a blessing to be able to, to live that dream for a short time. And, and I had injuries because of those big guys and um, had to find a new path in uh, 1990. So, but it was such a dream of mine as a kid, um, you know, and, and, um, and to achieve that, it was just really, quite frankly, amazing. Well, we're going to talk a lot about business. We're going to talk a lot about how you did it. Um, but the first thing I want to talk about is little, a little bit about your journey. You know, tell us, Mike, uh, about, uh, you know, well, first of all, what did your parents do? Yeah, well, I grew up in a small town in Mississippi, uh, Columbia, Mississippi, town of 5,000 people, by the way, the home of Walter Payton. Uh, so, uh, Walter Payton, I grew up in the same town, of course, he's older than me and, uh, but it was a great place to grow up. I, and I really did. I, I kind of bought the dream of being an NFL player when I was eight years old. Uh, Archie Manning was the quarterback for Ole Miss and then went to the Saints and of course around our neck of the woods here, everybody's Saints fans. And, and so I was as well, and I was going to be the next Archie Manning and, and, uh, it was really my first step and learning how to be successful, you have to dream about it. And I, you know, Daniel, I'd get out in the yard with a football, and I was by myself, but I would play an entire game. I was the receiver, I was the quarterback, I was the fans, I was the referee calling the touchdown. I was all of it just by myself, and I would stay out there countless hours. And, uh, but I always dreamed about it, and was quite frankly obsessed with it. And, um, and then the journey did take me to, um, you know, college at Southern Mississippi here in Hattiesburg, University of Southern Mississippi. And, um, and uh, so I was a quarterback. And so the problem with that was another quarterback signed the same year. And uh, his name was Reggie Collier. And uh, 1981, he was the first NCAA quarterback to run for 1,000 yards and pass for 1,000 yards in a single season. And he was ahead of me. So he was an All-American. And so uh, I guess the second uh, thing I learned about being successful is you got to persevere. And uh, because I set the bench for three years, I was the cleanest guy after every game. I hated it. It was the worst three years of my life. I, I held for PATs and field goals. So, uh, man, they just hung my jersey and all back up at the end. They didn't have to wash it. And, um, but it was awful experience. But, but I did learn perseverance. And in my junior year, I was a five-year senior, but my junior year, um, the coach came to me one day. Our tight end broke his ankle and uh, before the Alabama game. And he said, Landrum, you know all the plays. You're, the, you're, you know, we need you to play tight end. 
And I said, Coach, I got it. And uh, so I tran tran transitioned to tight end uh, my junior year, a few games into my junior year, played one year at tight end, started, and then the Falcons scooped me up in 1984 as an undrafted free agent. Uh, and I went to Atlanta. So it was, uh, you know, people look at you, well, you're an NFL player. Man, it was a tough career. That was a tough road. And, <laughs> but it meant you, you know? So, so what, how did your parent, like, what kind of role did your parents play in this journey that you went through? Tell us a little bit about your parents. I, I, want, I want to know the, the, the little Mike Landrum, you know, the little eight-year-old kid. Were you a bad kid, good kid? Tell me about it. Well, my mom and dad, you know, my dad uh, came from a tough uh, upbringing. He ran away at age 13, uh, you know, stayed gone nine months from Mississippi to Nebraska, hitchhiked to Nebraska, uh, I don't know, uh, wood, wood truck. And, um, and it was a tough upbringing, you know, had a just tough deal. He came home um, and, um, and got back in school and um and really surged uh you know made a life of himself and and uh dedicated he and my mom both dedicated their whole life to others juvenile delinquency uh runaways uh kids that you know that were orphaned or been in trouble with uh so uh my dad ended up being in the department of corrections and uh a youth court judge the last three years where uh, uh, about 10 of those years were at a place called Columbia Training School where it was a reformatory school and the superintendent, my dad was a superintendent, our home was right in the middle and it was like a, you know, about 500 uh, juvenile delinquent inmates in this prison for teenagers is what it was. And, um, but I grew up on that campus and, uh, but it was an incredible experience for me to, to watch my mom and dad give of themselves like they did their whole life. And I was the baby of five kids. And, um, you know, I just saw mom and dad just unselfishly give of themselves to people their whole life. And, um, of course, now they're 87 and 85, and they're doing some really special things still today. But, uh, but I, I felt like I, to, be, to have my parents and be in Columbia, Mississippi, a little town like that, it was, it was just a great – I tell people I had a perfect – childhood really you know I did so, so so were you were you a good kid growing up did you get good grades and everything I mean uh, you know uh, <laughs> I was a I'm your old typical C student uh you know uh school was tough for me man I'm not sure what dis learning disability I do have but there's a couple and uh it's, com it's a combination and uh but I'll tell you what I could always had. I had the ability to focus on something I really wanted to do and get it done. Uh, things I didn't want to do, I, I, um, I, I was just tough. Math was a tough subject for me. Uh, I, I avoided math. Uh, I never really made a good grade in math. Uh, it was awful. Uh, but, um, but, uh, but I did it excel in like speech class, uh, you know, drama club. I love, you know, those type things, sports, of course, and uh, history. I always loved history, and uh, but you know, it's uh, school was a tough thing for me. It took me literally six and a half years to get my college degree, uh, and it was in athletic administration and coaching. And um, you know, so it wasn't like I was getting you know a master's in business. Okay, it was, uh, but it was just it was a tough thing. But I went back, I finished that, and thought that's what I was going to do, but. Uh, but went on to a different direction, a financial company, like you said. And, and so did you, did, were, were your parents strict on you? Did they kind of hold you to a higher standard? Were they pretty I, tough or? Well, you know, uh, I think when you have five kids, we had five kids as well. It, it's almost like by the fifth one, it's kind of like, ah, oh, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> go mess it up. Oh, you'll be See all right. Happens. Yeah. You'll be all right. We, we, we got four. They're still all alive. So we'll just, you know, it's good. That one will make it. Love yeah, it. So, uh, but my dad now, my mom and dad were def definitely um, conservative in some ways. But by the time I, they were retiring from their first career, and uh, which was Department of Corrections, my senior year, right after my senior year, they retired. And uh, they started to go and they went in business for themselves after 30 years in the courts. And, uh, and uh, they still have that business today. But 
I would say by the time I came around, they were a lot looser, more relaxed as parents. Quite frankly, a lot like Amy and I are right now. You know, we're, we are, our last two kids graduated high school about four weeks ago. So, um, so here we are for the first time, Daniel, and we're like, oh my gosh, we're home alone. And, and so they both go to college here in about four weeks or less. And we're excited about that, you know, being parents ourselves and being empty nests. And so, so do you recommend, I mean, tell me your thoughts about pro athletics and as far as your kids going into athletics, being in athletics, and do you recommend the pro athlete life? I do. Um, you know, it's, 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 um, it's more about the process than it is attaining the, uh, the position, um, because, um, you know, it was something that taught me how to dream and, you know, taught me how to work with others. It, it taught me so much, as I mentioned earlier, about persevering and, um, and just, uh, you know, having work ethic, having consistency. You know, I was never the fastest player, nor was I the biggest player. I think I won my positions by waking up every day and, really, you know, having the mentality of it's going to be a great day, which is one of my mantras that I just developed over the years in college, actually, I would just wake up, it was a special K commercial on television. And and it was like, it was a jingle. And it was like, it's gonna be a great day, special K. And so that was on in the dorm all the time. And uh, in the the early 80s, and and I would hear that going to, and I would, I knew I had winter workouts, so I had to set the bench again this week, and I just started singing it to myself. So it kind of develops that, those habit thinking, you know, right thinking. And um, so, uh, but yeah, I think it's great. I think there's some, there's some physical neg- negative things about it that I have now being 57 years old, but truthfully, I would do it all over again times two. You know, and, and, and so uh, are there are there some dark things about pro athletics that, you know, you probably warn your kids about? I mean, because I mean, you, you have some potentials, right? I mean, you got some potential. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, about your kids and yeah, the potential kid, that they have. Yeah, Grant, uh, Grant, our oldest son, it was a, a Juco player here in a D2 program here. Now he's a He's in Miami. He's, a, he's in Miami Beach. He's a, a personal trainer and model down there. And then uh, Connor, uh, our 23-year-old, is in a uh, in the business with us here, and uh, who you've met. And uh, and then, um, but yeah, the, he played ball as well, JUCO and Division Two. Now Solomon, our youngest son, just is going to camp July 7th. He reports to his camp and a great program here and. Uh, you know, Solomon thinks he's going all the way to the league because uh, he's a long snapper. And so it's a specialized position these days. And so he's excelling in that. We're excited to see what he does with that. And uh, But, yeah, I think uh, obviously there's some dark sides. I, I wish I could go back to 1984, my rookie year, and and redo some things about my career, certainly. You know, I was I was in Atlanta, Georgia, the fastest growing city in the nation at the time, and single, and, you know, I'm just – you know, I could go back and redo some of that, sure. Uh, but, um, but man, I think overall, I, I, I think uh, I would just uh, play the ball on the field of my life again, you know, and do it all over again, quite frankly. Hey, hey, man, you went into financial services. So, I mean, how'd that happen? What, what was that all about? Well, what happened was after my NFL career, I had three knee surgeries my last 14 months in the league. I blew out my right knee against the Packers in 85, Green Bay Packers, and I had an ACL, MCL reconstruction. I came back the next year. It took me a year to come back. Uh, Then I blew out my left one, and I had an ACL and a chondral fracture, a quarter-sized chip out of your femur, lower in the joint. And... um, and so uh, that, was, that was the tough one. I could never recover. I had another surgery in 87 after that and just had another surgery two years ago on it again. Uh, that's the one that put me out. And so that was a really tough thing. Well, I got out at the last time I got off crutches in November of 87. I uh, got off crutches, literally, 
And I got in my car and drove to Destin, Florida. I'd never lived on the beach, Daniel. And I said, I'm living on the beach and I'm going to rehabilitate my knees on the beach looking at the ocean. And so I went to Destin, Florida, one of the most beautiful beaches in the country, and, uh, and got a condominium. And I started rehabilitating. Well, then I found a business partner. Uh, the Wave Runner had just come out. Okay, well, before the Wave Runner, I got into bed sheet business. Okay, now I'll I'll spare you that story. It didn't work. I lost five grand. Okay, and um, and it was humiliating. But the bed sheet business didn't work. I thought I was going to be the bed sheet king of America, but for about that long. And uh, and then um, T-shirt, the T-shirt business, you know, was really hopping down there. So I. I found a company and I started selling t-shirts and a t-shirt business. And, and that actually, so I sold some t-shirts. It just, my employees stole me blind, you know, and that did. And so, but then the wave runner came out in 1988. Okay. And so I saw a wave runner one day and I went, that's a cool vehicle. And so a buddy and I bought two of them and uh, put them on the beach and started renting them out. And all of a sudden we had 30. And then two parasail boats, six jet boats, six 650 Kawasaki jet skis. We had this operation, 16 employees. It was like incredible looking. And then, Daniel, listen, 100,000 credit at the bank. Then the rains came. And I'm going to tell you, if it didn't rain 40 days and 40 nights, <laughs> it rained 38. I'm telling you. It was <laughs> Look, and tourists, when it rains, they don't ride skis. They go shopping. So, man, we lost so much money. It was an awful experience. It taught me how to deal with adversity in business in class. And, uh, but, uh, but then it was, that was a two-year period that all that happened, the bed sheets, the T-shirts, the water sports. And then um, my brother David um, had been in the financial business 11 years, and I'd watched his life. And I, I saw this guy that, had literally dropped out of school and, uh, you know, had, you know, not been very successful get into financial business. And in 1989, he made $260,000 that year. And that was more than the NFL players that I had just left were making. Yeah. yeah. I got in the league when I left, 86, my last season was making a quarter of a million. So my brother in Jackson, Mississippi is making 260. I was like, okay, I need to talk to him. He's been trying to talk to me about this for eight years. It's time. And so, so literally, I, I, um, I sat down with him. And Amy and I met Amy in Florida, and we were getting married four months. And so it was, a, it was a timing thing where we just decided, you know what? We want to work together. We love each other. This company's saying we can be a partnership, and we're going to copy these leaders that, that my brother and his wife, Jill. And, and so that's what we did. And, that's the long story how uh, we got into financial business. Hey, 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 Mike, I, I just, I got to interrupt because it, it, this is, this is almost surreal having this conversation with you because this reminds me of, it, it almost tells the story of what could have happened with me and my brother. And by the way, you probably didn't know, I have an older brother named David as well. Okay. And a lot of people don't know this story, but I actually, my brother went to a meeting to check out the financial services business. And, and he came about two weeks before me, but he said no. He said no. He turned down the opportunity. And I come, I show up to the same meeting, the same office, two weeks later, and I join. And today, my brother, he probably, you know, I don't know how much your brother makes from you, but he makes a lot of money from you every year. My brother probably loses about $400,000 a year today because he said no to the opportunity. So sometimes, sometimes you just got to say yes, because I think about, you know, I was more like you, you know, I, I failed out of math. I was, uh, you know, a C minus D plus student. I, you know, I struggled. I mean, I wasn't the smartest guy. I read slow. Can't, you know, it takes me a little longer. But just like you, when I focus on shit, man, I like put everything in it and I go all out and I get it done. And usually I end up making something happen in it. 
out of it. You know, I tried all kinds of little businesses before. So I don't know, this is just crazy because I, I, now I really know why me and you get along so well. There's some sort of connection in there where we get each other. But anyways, so your brother recruits you finally after eight years. So did you just get it rocking fast? I mean, what happened? I wish uh, the first, my field training, you know, I had uh, 19 appointments my first week. Cause I, I asked David after uh, I, I, saw, I sat through my first company overview. I said, I said, okay, I'm ready to go. He said, I said, what do I do? He said, you need to put me in front of 10 people as quickly as possible. Cause one hour in the, in the, in the field is as good as 17 hours in a classroom. And so you just need to see me work. And I said, all right. And so I put him in front of 10 people that following Thursday. And uh, we went from literally 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. at night, no lunch. We just worked the whole time. And, man, I was bouncing off the wall. You know, I mean, I was just, I was like, oh, my goodness. I remember getting home that night, and I called my fiance, who they Amy now today, my wife. And I said, baby, uh, we're probably going to make a lot of money if I can learn all this stuff. <laughs> she said, <laughs> And I said, yeah. She said, why? I said, he's doing the same thing over and over. And they're asking the same questions over and over. If I can just pass the exam and learn this thing with some more repetition. And so, so then this, uh, the second week, I put him in front of another 10. And uh, that really is what changed our, our whole business. I, I, just, I just started just getting started in the field with him. Then I got my license. And now the first year, uh, we were in primary uh, in, in the financial business. What happened uh, the la the end of that year? We had a, our first child, uh, Julia Lake, and so here we are. We're getting it rocking, but like when things those flaming arrows come at you, uh, you know. And so Julia Lake was born and had this tumor in her mouth, and and so all of a sudden we found ourselves at Children's Hospital. We didn't have health insurance and. It was just like everything that could go wrong was going wrong all of a sudden, you know, and, and so we had 40,000 in medical bills piled up on us and 16 different bills coming from Ch Children's Hospital alone with that 40,000 in medical bills and we were just like, ah, uh, and we only made 17 grand that first year. But what was happening, I was getting uncomfortable redefining myself, you know, I, I'm trying to harness that work ethic, that passion and and, 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 and right thinking every morning to a whole new industry. It's not easy. I mean, then you got, you know, a new, you know, life with a family and a child that's really sick. And, and so, so then we kind of got through that first year, made 17,200. 17, then the second year, we made 27,000. So it wasn't a huge, like, it just wasn't this life change for us. It was, I couldn't pay my bills on that. And uh, so I was, man, I was selling things. I was doing whatever I could do to stay in, stay in business long enough. And, um, but I went to a big event and um, I'm, I'm, man, it was, I think it was a guy from Las Vegas at that big event who was making, he was a truck driver and he was making 50,000 part time. And, and I, I heard him get up on stage and he said, man, you're not making money. And he started talking about having eight appointments a week. You've got to get to eight appointments a week. If you sit in front of eight and tell our story, you'll compete for five, you'll close three, and you'll get one person that wants to come to work out of that. Eight, five, three, one. And Daniel, it was, I, there was 7,000 people in that meeting. This was 91, end of 91. And I'll be honest with you, it's like he was talking to me and I was like, that's it. That's my number, eight. I've got, to, I've got to start managing myself like I did ball. I was very disciplined in ball. And so let me have eight appointments a week and literally went home. The third year in business, we made 73 grand, built, built our first huge team. And it all started from that 1992 year and 93 when we, we feel like we broke free in uh, 93. It's, it's crazy. It's crazy because – what goes through my mind is all those people, Mike, I mean, come on. I mean, you're making over a million dollars a year and, and just, just about 99% of that is passive residual income. I mean, so it's not like you're hustling every day, writing, you know, eight appointments a week and crushing it every day. I mean, you, you got a pretty dang good life. I know how you live and I know all the freedom that you have, but imagine 
when you made 15 grand and you couldn't pay your bills, imagine if you would have quit. Like I, I was just having a conversation with a lady yesterday and she's like, I'm down to my last 8,000 in savings. And then you're telling me right now, and this is back in the early nineties. And you're talking about having 40,000 in debt in medical bills. And so there's a huge, you know, it's this like the decisions that we make in life have ramifications, man, that could last generations. I mean, 10, 20, 30 years of, of regret, you know, kind of like my brother not getting started with me. I mean, you know, I've been in business for 20 years and so that's 20 years he's been watching me and I've been trying to get him back, but you know, ego and just, you never can just do it, you know, just go all in. And, but I'm just, I was thinking about that lady right now when you were telling me your story and it's just, I, I hope she's listening because I hope she understands that this is not the time to quit. This is the time to double down on your efforts. Am, am I right on that? Yes. And you know, the thing, the thing that i found is that, see, when I came into business, I had about 20 some odd thousand left after the water sports business. And I'll be honest with you, Daniel, what I, what I see happening is most guys that come in with a chunk, a little, little uh, nest egg, they have to spend it first before they get totally uncomfortable. It's like, we all stop at the point of comfort. And if we do get over that line of being uncomfortable, you know, calling people that, you know, that kind of intimidate us, you know, the right market normally, uh, you know, we kind of avoid those people like, ah, they're probably okay. I'll call them later. But it's like, when you don't have anything left, you have to call them. And so it's like, you have to get over the comfort zone. And unfortunately, most people are fortunately, most people are going to have to spend all their savings before they get go really do what they need to do. And um, I think what happened with us, it was a humility before honor thing. I think, uh, you know, I was signing autographs 24 months before in Atlanta and, you know, the kind of one of the guys that kind of could walk in anywhere and, you know, had to lay of the land. And then all of a sudden I found myself out back in South Mississippi, you know, in a more rural area. And, um, and man, it was, it was a humility walk for me. And then, and then getting down to where, you know, my car, which was a really nice, you know, 633 CSI BMW when I got it, right? Beautiful burgundy, B gold BBS rims. I mean, you can just see that, right? And, right? and so, but man, when it gets 300,000 miles on it, and you know, and these imports, and uh, there's not an import mechanic around this area, it like broke down all the time. It just was always broke down. Wouldn't go in reverse at one point. So, you know, here I am starting a financial business in a car that wouldn't go in reverse. And so you couldn't pull into people's driveway. You had to park on the curb so you can just move on after you get back. I mean, it's crazy. I came out one time and that's crazy. Everything could go wrong, went wrong. I came out one time, the emergency brake had, had uh, released and uh, the car had rolled about 50 yards down a hill into a drainage pit and was laying on the side. So I drove, <laughs> the client had to call a wrecker for me and they had to lift it out like a recovery. That's my first experience, not with- Did towing. you write the sale? Did you write the sale? Uh, didn't do business with me. Did didn't not do, do business. business. <laughs> they wouldn't do it. And so it was like, you know, but see those are things that come at you that, you know, I, I'll be honest with you, that young man was, they were friends of ours. He and his wife were friends of ours, had a baby's our age, our, our kid our age. Uh, the babies were probably two. And uh, he had known me my whole career of football, but he didn't think I was going to finish in Primerica, you know, and he didn't think I was going to finish. And uh, so it was just, you know, he didn't believe. And, you know, and, and unfortunately now his life's a disaster. You know, but, yeah. you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's amazing to me, Mike, that, I mean, cause as long as I've been here, I've been here over two decades, man, two decades of my life. I mean, just about half of my life I've been doing this and it's so amazing. All those people that told me, no, 
All those people that told me it wouldn't work, all those people that told me it was a scam and it was a pyramid and, and it wasn't real and all that stuff. But yet I, I have yet to find anyone, Mike, not one person that has been super successful in business that all had their opinions about my business. And that's what I can't, I just, it, it, it boggles my mind that people don't really, really try to spend time with people that know what they're talking about before they make, do you, do you kind of see that people make prejudgments on so many things that are disastrous for them along their life? Do you see that? Absolutely. And I think it's still armchair quarterback. You know, it's like people, it's easy for people, you know, to sit up in the stands and go, well, they should have called this play. They should have called this play. You should do that. It's easy to, to do that. But, you know, I, I don't know. I've always, my football career was the same way. I, I had people that literally, you know, thought I was obsessed with football and I would never make it to the NFL, especially after sitting on the bench three years in college. And I had a lot of, um, um, I had a lot of training and taking that negative energy that people would try to, to press on me and, you know, turn it into, I'll show your ass juice, you know, and uh, because, uh, you know, because I had a lot, and, in, and, and, you know, in this business too, I come back and to Mississippi in 1990, there were already five offices with the company in a town of 35,000 people, five offices. So everybody had been talked to. My brother had already gone through my market. He would come when he would come visit the Falcons when I was playing with the Falcons, he'd make me make out lists for him every time. He'd just come home and go talk to all my market. So I had no more market left. All my family was clients, you know. And so I had to, I had to start from scratch. But and I was an hour and forty minutes away from his office. So it wasn't like I had a place to hang out. I was in the old robe in in my house most of the time and then driving figure eights around town you know, pretending I wasn't working. And uh, so it was just a, a nightmare. But, but you know what? It, you know, we had that ability, Amy and I had that ability to have that picture in our mind of what we wanted our life to look like. And we had to go through the hard times to be molded and to, to it was a test. I think it was a test. And um, you know, because, hey, it wasn't the only time we've been tested in 29 years, business, marriage, kids, all of it. I mean, it, you know, it just, you know, but man, I'm gonna tell you, I wouldn't want to be any other place. Uh, we hit the daggum lottery as far as I'm concerned, you know, and, um, but it is, it's a testing period. And most people, if you just get through the test and not quit and keep making progress, um, it'll be a big, it'll be big for people. Most people. Oh man, I, I completely agree. I mean, how, how important, because I think that people work jobs and, you know, they might be making 50,000 or a hundred thousand a year and they work and they work and they work. And how important has residual income and passive income been for you? And how important is it for, you know, to pe for people to really, really figure out ways to get it? I think is really important. Uh, and, you know, you said earlier, 99% of my income is passive, you know, and it is. And, um, and, you know, we're making a new run. So I'm back rebuilding a base, the biggest, the biggest team we've ever had, um, you know, was top three in the company every month for about five, six, eight years. And uh, so we're back, we want to break that record here within 12 months. And so we're back on it. And uh, again, have an empty nest. We just got a little different schedule than we're used to the last 20 years. But, um, but, uh, but I, think it's, I think it's so important. I think uh, it's important for, for, for folks to lay that goal out there and go for it and, and uh, maximize, maximize their opportunity. Absolutely. And, and I think that what you just said right now is so, because we talk a lot about happiness and we talk a lot about having a fulfilled life too, because look, I want to make bazillions of dollars, but I want to have a great life at the same time. You know what I mean? I don't want to get to the end of my days and be regretful that I didn't 
enjoy my life and I didn't have fun and, and be happy. And, and I think that the reason why you're a happy guy and I know you, Mike, and you're, you know, I mean, I know you're a competitor and you want to win and you get frustrated just like everybody else, but you're a pretty happy dude, you know, and, and I, and, and I wish you guys could see his face cause I'm, I could see his face and I can read people. Well, he's a happy dude, you know, and, and, and the reason why you're happy, Mike, is because you're making progress and you've always tried to make progress. You know, there's been times in your career where you've worked a little more, worked a little less, whatever, but you've always tried to make progress in your business. And I, and I think that's probably got a little bit to do with your happiness. What, what do you say about that? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I think every day you have a decision. I always tell people, you got to talk to yourself much more than you listen to yourself. Because if you listen to yourself, you will do nothing. You will, you will get frustrated. You get discouraged. Um, you'll take the easy way out. Uh, I don't know. There's just something inside of me that I, I mean, if I would have went on the path of coaching, I would have been a head coach. I may have been a general manager, you know, of a team one, you know, um, uh, one day. If I would have gone another direction, I, I'd, I just can't sit still. I, I want to make progress, like you said. I think that's the best word because I just want to get better. But I think you know, your attitude certainly determines your altitudes in life. There's no doubt about it. And it, listen, and this, is, this is critical. It's easy to be excited when things are great. Man, anybody can be excited when you got good things going on. I mean, anybody. I mean, most people can stay excited a couple of weeks or even a couple of months down the road. But man, a dad, a, a person that that that's gonna go and change the world, you know, that person stays excited for a lifetime. Now, I believe in seasons. I believe there's these seasons that I mean are easier for me to be honest with you to stay positive. And then there's those seasons, Daniel, that like aren't so easy. It's like, gosh, it's like you know, man, it's hard. It's like, man, what else is gonna happen? I mean man, what good grief, you know, I and, mean, but it's like, but I, but that's the beauty of seasons is that they change and that, you know, if you'll just stay true to, to, to who you are and your, your training with that attitude and the, the habit, that daily work habit that you have developed in your craft, uh, you find yourself down the road coming out of that hard season back into a harvest. And uh, because, it, and, and the way you get there is consistency. And it does. It starts with your happiness, with your attitude. It really does. And, um, and you know, that you were talking about winning with it, all areas of your life. And I want to as well. I, I, man, I, I want Amy and I to, you know, like my mom and dad are 67 years now, you know, and, and they're deteriorating right now. And it's so sad, but it's so beautiful in a way that they've been together 67 years, you know. So I swear, I want Amy and I to get that 67 years, right? We want our kids to turn out right and our grandkids, we want more of them, all that. And, man, we want to win financially. But so I think what all it does, it kind of brings that, that whole um, – it, it, it's for the, the everything of your life, you know. It affects all parts of your life. It's a beautiful thing. Hey, uh, how, how do you stay organized, man? I mean, tell me a little bit about your morning routine and how do you stay organized? Yeah, I make a lot of lists. I'm always making lists. I'm not an organized person. I'm a chaotic. It looks chaotic. If you looked at my planner, I use a paper planner. Um, so I'm using a, a, the old week at a glance that you get for 27 bucks at Office Depot, okay? I'm still old school with that. Uh, but man, I have to write everything down and I make multiple lists, you know, as the day goes on. Uh, I, I even have to, now listen, I have to carry my planner out of the car. When I go in, you'll find it on the bar of my home in the kitchen or by the refrigerator or near my chair. And so, but it's always open because this is what happens. My brain works like this. As if I don't, when I think, oh my gosh, I need to call Daniel Alonzo and set that appointment with him. And man, a guy I met, I met the other day in, in town. I've got to go write Daniel Alonzo down because I, I, it may not resurface for another month or two or three or four and the timing's off. 
So, so what I've learned is leave my planner open, make lots of lists. And I like to make my to-do list before I go to bed at night. You know, I've always heard your subconscious mind, you know, kind of really figures out if you make your list before you go to bed, it can literally program what you need to get done or conversations you need to have with those people when you wake up the next morning. So I've always practiced that. But what I've learned is you just can't rely on the night list. You've got to update. you got to update with the, the uh, new list at, throughout the day. Hey, so, uh, so tell me a little bit about, um, about recruiting. And, and, and obviously, recruiting is the lifeblood of our business. And I think it's the lifeblood of any business, of any, finance, of any successful organization. Um, you know, was there ever, uh, you know, something that you found that really helped you in becoming a, a great recruiter and a great builder in the business? Uh, you know, when I learned to build relationships, um, that is really the power play for me is to every day be nice to people, uh, make friends with people. And as I go have my great life and with my family and, uh, you know, whatever we do, you know, for fun, but then, you know, you know, worship, whatever, wherever we go, you know, I just, I'm just nice to people and I'm always, you know, uh, meeting people, having those itty bitty conversations that hopefully turn into bigger ones later. Um, that's my business. I mean, just, you know, and, and the beauty of that is, is you get to know a lot of neat people. Um, and so you meet a lot of folks, you, uh, become friends with them, but they also get clients and people come to work with you and all. So it's almost like cultivating a market as you go through your life. And now I want to do it for the right reasons. I don't want to manipulate anybody and anything, you know, I mean, a beautiful thing of our products is we can't hurt anybody with our products. So there's, that should liberate you to talk to everybody about what you do. But, uh, but, you know, I just find, you know, friend making professional friend making is really, the way to go about business the most, in my opinion. I, I tell people all the time on my business card, it should say, my title should say professional friend maker. Yep. That's it. That's what we are. We are professional friend makers. Anybody in business, by the way, should be networking with everyone, building relationships. Not that you're going to sell everybody, not that you're going to recruit everybody, but just make a friend, man. And you can't have too many friends, right? Um, hey, look, I mean, you know, kind of winding down here a little bit, Mike, um, you know, what, what's, why do, why do so many people struggle? You know, I, I've seen so many people come through business through the years and why do they struggle? I think some people have just quit things in their life and it's, and it's almost like their default switch. It's like they, you know, you know, I know my brother David, you know, um, you know, talked about, you know, he had quit most things before he found this business in 1979. And then when he found this business, he was 24 years old, had just been married and would just come out of the military and was on at school on GI Bill at Southern Miss Business School. He found this business. And then when he found this, Daniel, he said, just, I'm totally committing. I'm not going to quit. So I think, I think people that have quit things like Dave said he had done previous uh, of this career, you know, it's like at some point you just plant your flag and say, you know what, I'm finishing this. I think people have got to finish. I, don't, I think a lot of people, you know, I have, I bought a Peloton and so, you know, bike. And, and so if you got 30 minutes on a Peloton ride and you know, you're exhausted, and that last three minutes is the hardest, right? And so, you know, I'm going to think nobody's in the room with me. It's in my house. So I could get off that thing at 27 minutes, but I can't. <laughs> I think you just, you know, I think start building in those, that mentality of I'm going to distance. I don't care if it's on a Peloton or if it's on a treadmill or what it may be. You know, I'm going to finish the job. And, um, and so I think just, you know, uh, at some point in your life, I think you just have to finish something 
and uh, for that small or big win and um, and then kind of build that into your life. But but I think it's um, I think it's that and I think it's mental toughness. A lot of times I think, you know, it may be, a, you know, it may be an issue where, you know, um, you know, they, they, they just don't I think they just maybe don't do enough self improvement. They don't, they don't hang out with the right people. Uh, you know, I think you got to disassociate. You know, I had to disassociate with some of my homeboys when I moved here. They were just headed in the wrong direction when I came back in the early 90s. And these are guys I grew up with. These are my boys. But it's like, and, that, and they would make fun of me. Like, oh, well, Landrum, when you get off this, you know, this little dreamy run that you're making, come hang out with us again. They told me that one day. And, um, and man, you know, if you look at their lives now, you know, two or three of them, it's a disaster. And, um, so, you know, it's like, I don't know, I think you got to disassociate. You, you've got to, you've got to reinvent yourself, you know, if, you know, and then, um, you've got to be, just be real consistent over time. And I think your business lifts, you know, work through that. Tough what's your, work. what's your favorite book, Mike? Say favorite self-improvement book. What, what would you say? I'll be honest with you, my favorite one, and you know, I, I go back to it. I've read all a lot of different books, but man, I, man, I love the Bible. I, you know, like, you know, it's funny you say that. Y yesterday, um, you know, I woke up at 3:30 a.m., and that's not like me, uh, you know, to wake up at 3:30. But I knew, but I knew that, I, and I couldn't go back to sleep. And I got up, and I just felt like I needed to to read the book of James. And so for anybody, you know, that wants to be encouraged, read the book of James, it's really brief chapter, uh, two or three chapters, but it's just so powerful. And, uh, and it talks about going through adversity. And, uh, but I'll tell you, that's my, my favorite book, no doubt. Favorite food? Uh, my favorite food, uh, Italian. Do you... Uh... You have a favorite movie? Uh, man, I have to tell you, uh, I love Braveheart. <laughs> That's one of my favorite movies. Uh, of course, any movie like, uh, you know, I love those movies that move me. Like, remember the Titans? Uh, you know, a Braveheart, uh, you know, even Blindside that showed, you know, just love for common man and, you know, I love those types of uh, movies like that. And normally, I, I love that kind of stuff. What's the ultimate dream, man? What, what, what's, what's your ultimate dream? You know, um, our, our next, you know, my screensaver right now, you, you can see it, uh, is the uh, $2 million ring. And um, I'm, we, Amy and I are focused on getting the $2 million in income. We know what that's going to take. It's going to take... Uh, another 40 promotions at vice president. We feel like she told me the other day, she said, listen, you've always told me I get everything I've ever wanted. And I said, that's right. And she said, I want the 2 million ring for my birthday next year, which is July 11th, 2020. And so, uh, so it's, it's going to be a run, but uh, we're going to go for it. And, um, you know, cause that means that, you know, there's no base shot requirement after that. Uh, that have thrust us into probably about 35 first generation RVPs. It'll take a hierarchy over 100, a million a month in life, a thousand recruits a month, and 12 million a month in investments, 200 codes a month, you know, issued. And uh, so that's really what we feel like we're going for right now, to be honest with you. It's given us a great little surge in our brain. And we know that's what's got to happen first before we go beat the pavement and make it happen. It's got to happen in our head. And so that's kind of where we are. Mike, you're a, you're a total inspiration, man. I mean, you are one of the absolute heroes of heroes. And I hope that everybody shares this podcast. If you're listening right now, I'm here with Mike Landrum, one of the legends in financial services, one of the legends of our business. And uh, just so proud of you. I mean, just outside looking in, Mike, I mean, you have done such an amazing job as a father, as a husband as a businessman, um, you know, just across the board, man, you should be so, so extremely proud of yourself. And, uh, and I'm, I'm always here for you, buddy. I'm rooting for you all the way, man. I got your back 
And, uh, and I just, I, I just want you to know, uh, I just want everybody to know that if, look, if you want to get a hold of Mike, how do we get a hold of you, man? How, how does somebody, cause I know there are people out in your area. They're like, I want to be a part of that dude's business. I want to know that guy. How do they get a hold of you? Well, you know, obviously we're at Hattiesburg, Mississippi, uh, uh, on Instagram, Landrum legends. We have it Landrum legends and, uh, uh, but you're welcome to communicate uh, with us there. And, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not the social media guy. You are, as for that, I'm sure. But, uh, but I, you know, I want to say this about you. Um, man, I'm, I'll follow you. As you know, I don't follow. I have 20 people. Most of them are my kids and my son-in-law, right? And, uh, but, um, but, uh, but, man, I follow you because I love it, dude. I mean, you're, when I watch you on these Instagram clips that you put on, I, it's what I cut my teeth on in business. You know, the West Coast. Uh, you play that West Coast offense, I call it, and uh, the great leaders that, that trained you and mentored you that, that, I, that I had to grow up with myself. And uh, I love it, dude. I, so I want to tell you publicly, keep doing it. You're helping a lot of people like my son and, you know, who follows you as well, who's in the business and many others. So on our team. So you keep up the great work, dude. You're doing an awesome job. And I want to come get in that backyard, get by that pool of yours one day. Yes. Very, very soon, man. Don't you ever come to California without calling me, Mike. I will, I'll take you out, buddy. All right. I've taken out some big guys before, man. So I'm not afraid. All right. So, <laughs> hey, uh, hey, everybody, just want to let you know to make sure you share this podcast. Follow me on Instagram. Follow Mike Landrum on Instagram. And, uh, of course, we're signing people up every single day for our Wealth on the Beach Club. Every week, I got a full lesson, a full Q&A with me every Wednesday morning, 9 a.m. Check out uh, all the details on alonzoacademy.com. As always, subscribe on my YouTube channel for lots of free content. And as always, dream bigger, but make sure that you do it now. God bless you. We'll see you at the top.